Buenos días. Basta a todas las propuestas de ley anti-inmigrantes. 
Basta a las políticas de represión al voto en la nación que excluyen a los latinos del proceso democrático. Basta a sistemas educativos que excluyen a los niños latinos. Basta a los crímenes de odio contra los latinos. Ya basta. This is why today the work of NHLA is more important than ever. We are an aggressive coalition that is going to hold our leaders accountable for their actions and policies um, and, and the impact that they have in our community. We are presenting this agenda to the RNC and the DNC to ensure that Republican and the Democratic leaders adopt our Hispanic public policy agenda recommendations as priorities for the next Congress as well as for state legislators. With regards to Congress, we intend to hold them accountable for progress or the lack thereof in the areas outlined. We will issue a two-year progress report outlining what issues have advanced and which have not. It is through this report that we will inform and prevent the Latino voters in 2014 and 2016. Post the convention and through the 2012 elections, NHLA plans to meet with Republican and Democratic leaders on Capitol Hill. We are requesting a meeting with, the pre with President Obama as well as Governor Romney to secure the commitment that we have done here today. By adopting these priorities, party leaders have an opportunity to gain the integral political support from the Latino community and key organizations around the country. It is very clear that the Latino vote has become decisive force in national elections and our vote will keep growing. Both parties need to earn the Latino vote. And we are here to repeat that line. Both parties need to earn the Latino vote. If Republicans want the Latino vote, they need to stay away from the extremism that a sector of the party is pushing for, and is also reflected in the recently released platform, particularly on the issue of immigration, border suppression, and attacks on workers' rights. We will not tolerate this. In the case of Democrats, they, not, they should not take the Latino vote for granted. In the face of unprecedented extremism and anti-Latino rhetoric from the right, Latinos are gravitating toward the Democratic Party. However, the Latino community will not follow any candidate simply because she is the lesser of two evils. Democrats will have to take affirmative steps, steps demonstrating that they are a party that represents Latino interests too, and not merely a party whose appeal to Latinos is predicated on the other guys are worse. While we commend the administration lawsuits against state-based immigration laws and its creation on, on the fair action for childhood arrivals, this, these steps are reactionary and temporary in nature. We must stop reacting to this anti-immigrant climate and instead take positive steps to protect the Latino community in particular. It is time to stop playing defense and start playing offense on the central issues that we're going to be discussing and are discussing today. In NHLA, we have a number of committees and working groups with experts in each area that create recommendations for the entire body. These committees are education, civil rights, immigration, economic empowerment, government accountability, and health. And we're going to hear some of those recommendations today. <coughs> On the issue of immigration, these are all recommendations. Enact comprehensive immigration reform which includes an earned path to legalization and citizenship, unites families, allows workers to enter with the rights and protections that safeguard our workforce, curtail the state and local enforcement of immigration laws, enact the DREAM Act, revisit per country caps, reduce the average processing time for green card applicants, 
recognize the important benefits that naturalization confers on our nation, demilitarize the southwest border, invest in cost-effective alternatives to detention. With that, now we'd like to introduce Dr. Juan Andrade, the President of the United States Hispanic Leadership Institute. He's going to present our policy recommendations on education. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hector, and thank you all very much for being here. Just very briefly on this topic of education, uh, a couple of comments. Number one, the education of Latinos in America has been described or characterized as a national tragedy. And I think both of us who have lived through the experience can attest to that. There is very little, there's nothing, if anything, to brag about as far as our academic achievement is concerned. As we move forward, we have to create a culture of, of educational or academic achievement in the Latino community, where every household has on its wall a diploma that it can point to yeah. as the first child who may have graduated high school, the first one who may have gone on to pursue post-secondary education or training, the first one who may have graduated some, from some institution or some uh, program beyond high school. It's extremely, extremely important. For the very reason that our president, uh, Hector Sanchez, alluded to, we're talking about Hispanic empowerment. This is fundamental to the empowerment of the human community. We all know, uh, if you look at other groups, the more educated other groups are, the more likely they are to venture to vote, the more likely they are to turn out to vote, the more likely they are to create wealth, the more likely they are to, to uh, provide for their children and their families, to get them through the, uh, the educational system despite its own limitations, that we are able to overcome those, uh, those limitations, those flaws that we find in our schools today. With good parenting, with a well-educated generation of young Latinos, uh, we can create that culture of education that has been lacking in our community. We can create that culture of academic achievement that needs to characterize the next generation of Latinos in this country and for generations to come. Today, we see ourselves at a, at a serious uh, uh, setback, a dilemma of sorts, if you will, in going into this election, where after the last general election of 2010, we lost 800,000 Latino registered voters. These are citizens of voting age that we lost from the voter rosters for one reason or the other. We, there's a number we could allude to, but suffice it to say, Bottom line, we lost about 800,000 voters. So going into 2012, we have to register 800,000 Latinos to vote just so that we can be back up to speed where we were in 2010. To make up for lost ground, that is no way to progress. We must gain new ground, not, not make up for lost ground. But yet that's where we have found ourselves for most of this past year. And time is running out. We're only a month away from the registration deadline in most of our states. If we're, if we're going to be able to in, uh, grow the electorate and increase the number of Latinos that are prepared to vote in the November 6th election, uh, we have a lot, a lot of work to do. Over the long term, the best way to address this issue, the deficiency in civic participation, is through education. That is the long-term solution. That is why we're here. There's, uh, I doubt I would venture to say there's no one here in this room today that has that it does not have at least a high school diploma. I would probably suggest that there's uh, uh, several in the room who have college degrees, bachelor's degrees, even master's degrees, uh, doctoral degrees. That is what we need to create, not to be the exception to the rule, but that needs to be the rule itself across uh, the United States and for the future generations. With that, I'd just like to just a little segue into our policy recommendations. Again, this is fundamental to the progress, the empowerment, and prosperity of the Latino community. That we need to propose that we renew and fully fund the, the, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, otherwise known as ESEA. That we maintain a robust federal accountability system. That we ensure that college and career ready and common core standards are that include valid assessments of English language learners. 
that ensure states receiving a flexibility waiver under ESEA continue to collect and report student subgroup data in a fair and just manner. That we institute universal preschool that meets national standards, that we improve Hispanic achievement in the STEM fields, that we deliver extended learning opportunities and wraparound services to keep students in school and on track for achievement, strengthen financial aid programs, same thing that we proposed as far as immigration is concerned, we must enact the DREAM Act. We must invest in institutions and programs that promote Hispanic achievement in higher education and invest in outreach and education programs targeted especially at Latino veterans. Thank you very much. And we'll be back later at the, after the others have presented to answer any questions with regard to immigration or education or any other field that it is in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andrade. My name is Brent Walks. I'm the National Executive Director of the League of United Latin American Citizens, and I'm also Vice Chair of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. And to our members, the issue of civil rights is of paramount concern because we believe that all Latinos should be able to participate in our civic life and our community life as well. And while you may not um, be talking to the Latino community, hear civil rights as the top um, issue that they identify. They're going to talk about it. They want a good job. They want a good education. They want a roof over their heads, want food on the table, want health care. If they have a question with immigration, of course, they're going to want to have immigration reform. Those issues will be mentioned before you hear civil rights. But actually, civil rights is very much at the underpinning of all those issues because it really gets at the core of what we're all about as an organization, as a community, is to ensure that our community is treated fairly, to make sure that there isn't discrimination taking place across the country, both by government agencies as well as by um, folks out in the private sector. And so this was why it's so critical to us. And if you can just think about the young child that, that Dr. Andrade was talking about, trying to, um, you know, perhaps the first in their family to go to college, trying to make it through one of the toughest schools, one of those dropout factories that are out there. And then on top of that, having, you know, discrimination being visited upon, upon that child, trying to get a good education, but having you know, a governor like Governor Brewer coming in saying that I want to keep track of all the folks that have parents that are undocumented in my state or like they did in, in, in Alabama, or, or perhaps um, they're trying to go to college, having, having his right to go to the school question. Um, so this is, this is the challenge. If we don't have a level playing field for our community, uh, the efforts that we're working on in these other areas are going to be difficult to achieve because um, at the same time we're trying to propel the community forward, there are folks who are trying to hold us back. And that's why civil rights is so critical to us. So I'm going to talk about some of the planks that we have. You know, our organizations have been very, very aggressive on trying to ensure that the Latino community has the right to vote. And we are against photo identification requirements or any other measures that disproportionately impact our community, trying to prevent us from having the opportunity to vote. The measures that, for example, discourage uh, organizations like the members of the NHLA from engaging in voter registration by changing rules in terms of having to turn in the voter cards within 48 hours as they did in Florida. Or um, in, te as in Texas, where they said you had to be certified in every single county in which you wanted to register a voter, even though it's the same training all across the state. Those types of things, there's only one reason to do that. And that reason is to prevent people from voting. And that, when you do that, you're actually destroying the American democracy. So we're against that. Uh, we also support a constitutional amendment to rein in unlimited corporate money from disproportionately influencing our elections. When corporations are able to spend so much money, they dilute the strength of the actual American voters. And that means that our community suffers at the hands of corporate interests. So we're against unlimited corporate funding of presidential and any campaign for that matter. We also want to safeguard the Constitution, uh, the continuation of the Census Bureau data collection. It might be hard for some to imagine, but they, there are those in Congress who are actually encouraging um, changing what the Census Bureau can count so that we don't even know what the issues are in our community. We don't know the extent of the poverty. We don't know the extent of the health care needs. We don't know the extent of our educational needs. Um, and they're doing that because they think if it's out of sight, out of mind, we don't have to spend money on that particular effort to try to help folks. Um, it's really a cynical way of trying to address our um, our, our issues, and we believe the Census Bureau should be free to continue to do the, the, the work that they're doing, the great work that they're doing, and giving accurate data on our community and many other communities across the country. Um, 
We also encourage a comprehensive uh, FCC inquiry into the extent of the effects of hate speech in the media um, and to promote um, and expand policies on media ownership and diversity. This is an area that one of our members, particularly the National Tech Media Coalition, Alex Magalas, is here with us, has been championing. Um, hate speech, again, can be very, very um, divisive and is probably one of the principal areas that are holding our community back because you have the extreme power of the media to portray our community, and they're doing so in a negative light. People watch that, and then that translates into incredible opposition against our other key priority areas. So we believe that hate speech has no place in media. Um, the public airways belong to the public, and they shouldn't be used to denigrate a community. Um, we support efforts to ensure that the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Labor, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission aggressively pursue violations of voting rights, civil rights, workplace safety, and employment laws. You know, this is one area where, where you have to give credit where credit is due. The Obama administration has definitely stepped up a lot in this area. All of those agencies have been much more aggressive in enforcing their laws. Um, Department of Justice is bigger. Um, we, we're losing track of the number of cases that they're filing to protect voting rights, which is great. Um, Department of Labor under Hilda Solis has done an incredible job of enforcing labor rights. Um, so, so, so that is good, but, but administrations that matter, those, those same divisions under the previous administration were not as aggressive, and as a result, we did see an uptick in discrimination in those areas. Um, we also enact, uh, believe we should enact legislation that cracks down on and reprimands authorities involved in racial profiling. Again, if you can't go with confidence to the police to report a crime or to get protection for your family, um, you are really denied um, the equal protection under the law. This is something that is extremely important to us. There is no place in our nation's law enforcement for discrimination. We also believe in providing sufficient funding to effectively implement the Elder Justice Act. Um, many seniors are being taken advantage of. Um, it impacts not only Latinos, but many other communities, especially with the proliferation of uh, online cyber crime and things of that sort. We've got to make sure that our seniors are protected because there's a lot of scams going on and it's becoming a multi-billion dollar industry, unfortunately. We, we need to maintain and enhance the Violence Against Women Act, including all the protections for undocumented victims of domestic violence. This is an area that they were trying to strip the protection for undocumented victims out of the bill as a, as a supposed compromise to get it passed. We believe it should be passed as it is with those protections in place. And we also believe this, we should significantly increase efforts across the federal government to ensure language accessibility standards are carried out in all federally conducted activities. Um, and that includes some of the um, agencies that have done poorly in this area. Um, that's really important. And again, this is another area of, of contradiction you see with the Obama administration efforts to try to increase this. Um, and then you see on the other side efforts to actually pass English only laws, which would prohibit the government from communicating with its citizens in the language they can understand. We think that's a huge mistake. Finally, um, we believe it's really important to nominate and confirm judges that have demonstrated records of preserving and expanding civil rights protections legal protections that reflect the growing diversity of our community. If you, if you think about all these key landmark cases that we've seen just in the last year, and then you think about the importance of the judiciary as the last resort for our community to get justice, um, we have to have good representation in those courts in order to get a fair shake. And when you stack the courts against our community, that would be the last line of defense that, that, that disappears. We can't afford to do that. And so we believe strongly in the diverse judiciary. So these are just, uh, again, some Priority areas in civil rights, again, it's not necessarily the first thing that's going to be mentioned by the committee, but it underpins so many of the other priorities that we have, and that's why the members of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda are so focused on this area to make sure we preserve and protect the community's civil rights. Thank you. Mimi Gonzalez will be here in a second. She's going to present the, the economic empowerment section. Now we're going to move with Al Gallegos, president of the National. Association of Hispanic Federal Executives. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. How is everyone doing today? My name is Al Gallegos. I'm the chair for the Government Accountability Committee of HLA. I'm also the National Association President for the National Association of Hispanic Federal Executives. And our goal there is to make sure we try to empower, energize, and inspire Latinos and Latinas to join senior executive service of the federal government. The federal government is not a very sexy issue, like some of the major issues that you hear about every day, education, immigration, law enforcement, environment, health. But guess who runs those programs? It's the federal government. 
The problem that we have now is within the federal government, we don't have enough Hispanics to run those programs that affect Hispanics on an everyday basis. So we need to get some of the federal workers up there, especially at the career executive level, because that's where the decisions about funding are made, and the policy are made. You know, there's a saying called, there's a saying that says, uh, you gotta be at the right place at the right time. Well, guess what? That's all that. This is a new era. And Mr. Sanchez is helping us get into a new era. It's not about being at the right place at the time. It's about getting there before the right time. And not just the place. We need to create that place. And we can do it. 50 million strong. But we gotta really concentrate on that. Uh, as far as Hispanics and the federal workforce, there's three main points I'd like to make. Uh, the first one is the federal workforce fails to reflect the face of America, as Hispanics remain the only underrepresented racial group. Second point, the lack of proportional Hispanic representation has been and is a persistent problem regardless of what parties in the White House. The third point, there's a predicted mass retirement within the federal government that's a lot of us leaving. Say it, but yeah, I'll be one of them. And so that gives all the agencies and departments an opportunity to change the numbers, to hopefully change the numbers, meaning more Hispanics to have uh, the federal government reflect the face of America. And I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments on each one of those points. On, re on reflecting the face of America, okay, despite representing 13.6% in the civilian workforce, uh, there's only 8% Latinos within the federal government. And that gets even worse within the executive level. Um, and at a time when Hispanics are truly most of America's growth population, the higher numbers are growing, not going the other way. Uh, the second point, uh, the lack of proportional Hispanic representation has been an, a persistent problem regardless of what parties in the White House. Uh, the comment is that the absence of representational number of Hispanics across the federal government undercuts the ability to produce policies that are inclusive, fair, and responsive to the concerns of the community. As a result, Hispanics and issues and programs affecting them are either overlooked or managed effectively. And again, all those issues are what I just mentioned. Immigration, health, environment, housing, education, law enforcement, whatever issue is popular out there right now and very important. We, deal, we need to deal with it as Hispanics. Now, the third point, I can get my paper here. The third and last point, uh, there's a predicted mass retirement of federal workers again leaving the federal government. Since Hispanics constitute the largest and one of the fastest growing segments of our population, it would appear to be a perfect <coughs> opportunity for both to backfill positions and to commence an affirmative, concentrated effort to change the paradigm from one of exclusion to one of inclusion. And the federal government must work for creating equal opportunities to remedy the historically severe underrepresentation of Latinos in the federal workforce. And I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll give you a couple of most important policy recommendations we came up with. Uh, the first one, it should be obvious, substantially, and affirmatively increase the number of Hispanics in the federal workforce, including increasing representation of Hispanics in the career SES field. And notice I put the word career in front of SES. Uh, yes, the executive field has increased to some degree. A lot of it has been the uh, politicos, executives come in, and we love them. We want to keep them. But unfortunately, after four years, they leave to get replaced. But we're left with the career executives. The ones that are in for 20, 30, 40 years running our programs. That's where we are in the Latinos. Uh, the other policy recommendation is we are working with the Hispanic Council of Federal Employment, OPM, and we're coming out with uh, accountability models for the government. Uh, also, we're working with USDA. Uh, and we recommend that the what they're coming up with, that it gets institutionalized within the federal government. One last point, uh, recommendation, is to de 
develop a pipeline of Hispanic candidates leading into what's called the GS, general schedule, GS 14s and GS 15s positions, and into the SES positions. There's a program called the Candidate Development Program, which trains uh, people to be executives, and actually also the career SES positions. So we need that pipeline to keep people going. Especially again now, as so many people are retiring, we need those young people to be developed within the federal government. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with is all these recommendations won't work unless they are, uh, there's a strategic plan that the agencies come up with, mm -hmm. that their the plans are implemented, enforced, funded, and validated. And this issue about enforcing and funded, they go hand in hand. You can have all the policies in the world. If they're not funded, nobody's going to enforce them. So thank you. Thanks to you. agenda, um, as I mentioned, we're going to be very aggressive presenting this to uh, Republicans and Democrats. Something that is very important in the work that we do is we present this agenda and we meet with the Secretaries of State. In this administration, we met with all of them except two. So it's very important to have and focus on those particular issues with uh, each one of them. We have a good friend in the room that has the opportunity to look at our agenda. Secretary Salazar, thanks for being with us, and I invite you to share the work. Interior, uh, one of my 
key functions have been to make sure that we're telling all of America's story. And so we've taken Latino heritage and we put it on a pedestal with Barack Obama's strong support to make sure that the story of all of, all of America is told. That is very, very important. When you look at how the Latino community has worked so hard to stand up education, and all of us who are here today know that uh, the keystone to our own opportunity to succeed was our ability to get into university and college that we will pay for. When I had eight children, eight siblings in my family, all eight of us became first generation college graduates. My parents were poor, no literacy, no telephone on the ranch. And yet, because of college grants and because of student loans, we were able to have that opportunity and all of us got to be college. Who has been with us in that march to make sure that education is affordable to all? To Barack Obama from day one. And so today, he continues on that march to make sure that we have accessibility to higher education. And I could go on and list a whole host of other things. But at the end of the day, dime con quien andas, y te diré quien eres. You know, who's walked in our shoes? Who has told that he could not do these things? And yet, you know, he has now become president of the United States of America. So he understands the pains and the struggles and the hopes and aspirations of ordinary Americans. And he understands the hopes and aspirations of the Latino community. And it's why he appointed a Latina, uh, Justice uh, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, to be on the United States Supreme Court. So he appointed uh, the daughter of a farm, of a worker in California, Carlos Solis, to be Secretary of Labor. That's why he has in his White House today, people who worked with me uh, for a long time in my U.S. Senate office and, and interior as well, who are inside the voice of the White House giving advice on a daily basis. So I can only appear here to say two things. One is this Hispanic agenda is a good agenda. It's something which is so important to the 54 million Latinos who now live in the United States of America. And it's so important to the future of this country because you cannot leave 54 million people behind or make them second class citizens. They have to be fully integrated into the mosaic of life of opportunity in the United States of America. And the second point is that the person who I have seen walk with us in word and in deed and in his own life experiences has been Barack Obama. So I'm going to be working very hard. Our own state of Colorado is probably Baca knows so well. It's a tough state. But I know that our state is going to go with the president. I very much am looking forward to continuing to work uh, in the implementation of the Hispanic agenda. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. And that's why the role of NHLA is to make sure that uh, in the next administration, we don't only have uh, Secretary Solis and Ken Salazar, that we have five of you in the administration <laughs> representing the Latino community. Thank you for stopping by. <laughs> now we have Dr. Camila Cruz and Eliana Rios to present our priorities on health. Thank you, Hector. Good morning. Um, in addition to what my colleagues have said already, which are critical issues for our community, health happens to also be another um, element of our lives that impacts uh, the economics of our families, employment, housing, education. That little kid that um, Dr. Andrade described would be in a very difficult situation if, uh, if he or she did not have access to health care. So indeed, health is directly correlated to our quality of life as well as our levels of productivity and economic security. It also has a direct and indirect impact on our families, communities, and country. And Latinos know this very well. More than one in three Hispanics are uninsured. Latinos, as we know, suffer, suffer disproportionately from diabetes, obesity, cancer, HIV, and heart disease. We also have lower rates of immunization. And about one in three Latino children go, go to sleep hungry each day. At the same time, Latinos will comprise a greater share of the nation's future workforce. An unhealthy community and workforce not only represents a burden for families and employers, but the whole country as well. Whether we are the patient with a chronic disease, or the family member, or caregiver, 
who takes care of their sick loved ones. We must work to drive down healthcare costs. That is why we need to reverse existing health inequities in our communities. And prevention is key. We know that chronic diseases and conditions don't um, occur overnight. There are several stages that take place before a person's health takes a turn for the worse. So promoting and creating access to affordable preventive care and services is key to obtaining health equity, as well as helping bring down the general cost of health care. And so at the core of NHLA's health policy recommendations is a focus on access to care, particularly access to preventive care. That is why we stand behind the Democrats' work to implement the Affordable Care Act. We believe this landmark law is solid and is a first step in creating access to care for all and in bringing down the general cost of health care for our society. And so the, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, we'd like to see the Affordable Care Act implemented promptly and in, in its entirety. The, the act is a good piece of legislation that requires time to me, but it's moving us all in the right direction. It's addressing the factors that lead to health disparities, especially above, um, among those who most in need, children, pregnant women, older adults. And, it, and it's doing it through prevention services and expanded access to health care. However, there are other parts of the law that we would like to see strengthened and we hope Democrats will work with us. We would like to find a way to implement the CLASS Act to provide patients with affordable and accessible long-term health care insurance plans. We want to increase funding for, for the Ryan White Care Act, as well as release programs, uh, related programs so that the national HIV strategy can be fully implemented. We'd like to see the five-year waiting period for legal residents to access Medicaid be eliminated, as well as maintain the Medicaid expansion in the Affordable Care Act to people who are 133% of the poverty line. Another aspect of the health policy we have included in our recommendations is the need for more cultural and linguistic competency in the healthcare, in the healthcare field. We know that there's much more at risk than just being lost in translation when it comes to health-related interactions between a patient and a healthcare provider. We know too well that cultural and linguistic competency isn't simply about speaking the language. Rather, it's about acquiring specific knowledge and understanding about the community being served. It's about creating a bond, establishing a relationship, and securing a level of trust. This way, patients have the tools and information they need to make informed health decisions. And closely tied to this is the diversification of the healthcare workforce, creating opportunities for young Hispanics and Latino healthcare professionals to serve their communities is not only gratifying and creates a sense of purpose, but it serves as another meaningful way to address health disparities in our society. So the bottom line is that as a matter of public health and common sense, we must take action to ensure that the Hispanic community has the tools and resources it needs to be healthier. Healthier communities can focus on other important issues to make the country stronger. And it is with that spirit that we have set forth these policy and, and recommendations. NHLA is heartened that the issue of health care in the Democratic platform overlaps and aligns with several of the recommendations we are offering today. However, there is still work to be done, and we will continue to ask both Democrats and Republicans to rise to the occasion with us. NHLA believes that these recommendations will help move the needle significantly if implemented, but we can't do it without Congress and the White House. We strongly urge both parties to consider these policy recommendations and work with us to ensure they become a reality. And now I'd like to introduce um, my friend and colleague, um, someone who's championed uh, health issues across the country for many years, Dr. Elena Bios, and she will dive in a little deeper.
a, a coalition of 30 leading Latino groups across the nation that have come together to ensure that Latinos have one voice when it comes to these key issues and that we inform our policymakers about what that voice is in the issue of economic empowerment, uh, obviously education, immigration, government accountability, civil rights, and health, which you just heard as well too. So why should we care? Why should we care about this Latino agenda? Why do we keep hearing about the Latino vote? Why do we keep hearing about the needs and aspirations of the Latino community? Well, the answer to that is very simple. One is that we're 52 billion and growing. Uh, Secretary Salazar said we're 54 million. So that may be the new number, but it is a huge population, bigger than all the entire population of Canada, bigger than all of England, bigger than all of Spain altogether. And so we know, we know as leaders in our community that there is no America without the Latino community. There is no American success without Latino success. In many ways, Latinos have a great story to share in that respect, right? So we have the largest growing number of small business owners in the nation. We have a growing labor force that is contributing to our cities and our uh, towns across the nation. We're helping rebuild this country. And we also have an increasing number of Latinos going to college and universities and graduating with high quality degrees. That's a great story to be able to share with everyone. But, but, and this is a big but, but in order for us to succeed and continue sort of down that road of success, we need support. We need support by the federal government, we need support by policymakers, and that support is outlined in this agenda that you saw here today that was presented in part by my colleagues here. We urge Democratic and Republican leaders to enact this agenda, not only for the Latino community, for the well-being of this country, is the only way uh, road forward for either party. And so again, we urge everyone to sort of uh, take heed of this agenda and help enact it and help us uh, champion the needs and aspirations of the Latino community. With that, we'll take questions and answers. And Hector, wrap it up. Thank yeah. You. We're almost uh, there, so we're going to open it up for question and answers. All the principals and all the representatives of organizations, please uh, come forward, and uh, they're going to be available for one one uh, uh, questions too. Questions. What is the reaction of the movement of the Latino migrants? Uh, what is the reaction of the Latino migrants? How do we see the group? Let's analyze the platform. Con más claridad, pero lo que hemos visto ahora, al menos en, el, en términos de inmigración, este, eh, es, eh, se alinea con algunas de las cosas que nosotros estamos proponiendo. Pero como ya lo dijimos en la apertura, queremos que sean mucho más agresivos. ¿Qué le falta? Este, nos falta un compromiso totalmente serio eh, eh, de los demócratas a empujar eh, algo como la inmigración. Este, a que sea una prioridad, esto está dividiendo a nuestras comunidades, está matando a nuestras familias, está este, simple y sencillamente haciendo muy difícil la vida cotidiana en nuestra comunidad, no podemos esperar más, ya no podemos jugar a la defensiva, se necesita jugar a la ofensiva. ¿Por qué no califica como prioridad la opresión de ustedes? Bueno, para nosotros es una prioridad, entonces... Pero el documento no lo califica como prioridad, es que la plataforma, como tú dices que no, no lo... No lo No, hay una, hay una, no, queremos el compromiso real, este, eh, tanto del presidente como del, del partido en general, a asegurarnos que se implementen estas políticas en el aspecto de, de inmigración. Yo creo que hay una alineación en lo que vimos que se presentó ayer y algunas de las eh, propuestas que tenemos aquí. Entonces, es, esperemos que, que se sean mucho más agresivos, especialmente cuando también vimos a los republicanos y la propuesta que ellos tienen en en el aspecto de inmigración, que es mucho más políticas de mano dura. Mistaken impression that that would create the space to do comprehensive immigration reform that they would get 
bipartisan support because they showed they're bona fides and unenforceable. And that's not what happened. In fact, you could argue the opposite happened. It emboldened the enforcement folks, and they just doubled down and wanted more, more enforcement. You got a fence? Well, I want a second fence. I want an electrified fence. I want, you know, a 30 foot high fence. And they wanted more border patrol. And I think the, the, the mistake was that they underestimated the insatiable thirst that the enforcement folks have for uh, more and more punitive measures on immigration. And so by the time they realized this and came forward with their comprehensive immigration reform effort, they had already, unfortunately, um, lost a lot of the territory and lost a lot of the political capital. They were not able to get passed. So we, we, were, we were very vocal in saying that it wasn't safe. Uh, the, the record of deportations is not a, not a good thing. And it, this whole idea that you can show that you're tough on border enforcement and then get the conference reform didn't work out. And that's where you know, now we've been left with the, the, the deferred action for child arrivals. Uh, that's great to uh, establish something we had pushed for as a community. Glad that it happened. Um, but unfortunately, he was not able to get uh, the immigration reform bill positive in the past five hours. Do you feel like he'll change his policy in the next four years? Oh yes, I, I think that I think that um, we actually have um, something that happened after the, the announcement of deferred action for child arrivals. So that was something that we had requested for over a year to see administration take a step um, administratively without going through Congress to address the, the, the needs of the Max students. They kept thinking that they couldn't do it and have the power, but they were secretly telling us, "Look, if we do this, then we're really going to get." Republicans pushing for a bill to strip the president of the authority to do this type of, very type of thing, they won't be anywhere. But the reaction from Congress was not to strip the president of the authority. In fact, it was overwhelmingly supported by the public, even Mitt Romney has not really spoken out against it. So we think that there is now an opening to come back and say, you know what? Um, that was a good step, but it's just a temporary measure. We, we need to hold REMAC now. And perhaps this wave of anti immigrant hysteria has crested and coming back down. We have a chance to really pass conference on immigration reform. I think you know, President Obama does win, and um, we, we come back and hit this hard in the very beginning stages of the second term. I think we have a great chance not only get the Dream Act passed, but perhaps much more than that. And that's what I think our community organizations are pushing for. We want to see um, the promise that was made in the first term realized. So there's 
answer to your question is a central priority for us, and we're going to demand an answer from Governor Rock. And I'd like to join the organization as well. Perfect. Um, I have a Saying that you need less. 
So that's our, those, that's an, an important issue that Latinos electors can be looking at. Also, Latino voters, as you all know, are American citizens. But the immigration issue is, in fact, a litmus test about how we will be governed and those who govern us, govern us are going to address our communities. So those issues are very, very important. Will um, the governor gain 40% or better? I don't think so at this point, but he's obviously going to work very hard. It's time to move into the center. They're going to say whatever they said in the primary. It was not necessarily what they were thinking, and so they're going to try their very best. We shall see. Thank you. and relaxing and 
resting. And, and that is, that is a, what we all try to do. And, try, and, and I think as a doctor and as healthcare professionals surrounding people, whether it's in the home or hospice care or in the hospital, wherever you transit, transition from life to death, it's all about being comfortable. And when you have lung cancer and you can't breathe and you're on a, a drip of morphine, which puts you to sleep, and the drip gets dialed up, you can call that whatever you want. But for us, that's comfort care. And that's relaxing to the family to be able to witness 